Greeting once again, and a pleasure to be back. So today I'm going to talk about pharmaceutical supply chain management and logistics, pharmaceutical supply chain management and logistics management with a focus on the medicines generally. And in this particular video, I'm looking at the trends and the dynamics of the industry, looking at what was the past of pharmaceutical supply chain management, what are the current dynamics and what would be the expected actually outcomes into the future. And then the other bit would be key for us was to look at how do pharmacists and actually pharmaceutical supply chain managers take advantage of these dynamics and actually leverage this potential. And the major focus for me would be in terms of pharmacists, being we look at the now emerging trends are looking at some of the technicalities and these technicalities are not going to be managed by any other person who does not understand the basic underlying principles around pharmaceuticals and actually the handling of these pharmaceuticals. So to start the discussion off, I'll be starting with, with what the pharmaceutical supply chain and logistic management entails. We generally understand that when we talk about pharmaceutical supply chain and logistic management, you're looking at the movement and the supply of products from the manufacturing side to the ultimate end consumer. And the end consumer for pharmaceuticals is normally the patients when you talk about drugs. So therefore, it means the pharmaceutical supply chain managers and logistic management specialists are keen to look at how do they make the products get moved from the manufacturing site through the distributors, wholesalers, retailers, up to the ultimate patient who is going to use them. The ultimate patient can either be taking them from a pharmacy, taking them up from hospitals and even other outlets that might be available depending on the access program that they're involved in. So in that kind of a dynamic web of interconnected players, we need to have the supply chain managers who are able to understand the dynamics of the industry and are able to ensure that ultimately the products are getting to the people who need them and they're getting there in the right condition, in the right framework to ensure there are no any deficiencies. So the first bit we have to understand is what is the demand pool? Then what is the inventory levels that we have? What are the timelines that are available for us? What is the financing and the resource pool that we have to ensure that this is being met? So in terms of these dynamics, we understand that one of the critical contributing factors to actually lack of access to quality services, healthcare services, has been a shortfall in the pharmaceutical supply chain network. And therefore, that's why you'd see patients coming to hospital and they say medicines were out of stock and they were advised to go buy them from other pharmacies or from other outlets. When this happens over a couple of times, definitely the trust in the healthcare system fails. So for that trust not to fail, then it means as healthcare professionals or pharmacists who are doing dealing with pharmaceutical supply chain management, we need to up our game and ensure we are meeting these current needs and actually envisioning future needs to be able to respond to them and actually design models that are going to curb these kind of challenges. So that is where we are looking at it from pharmaceutical supply chain management right perspective. And one of the key things we have to acknowledge in the past, in the initial moments when medicines were being invented and delivered to for care, the aspect would be, are they available? Development has not been in the African continent, continent as we look at it. And therefore most of the drug design and development was in the European countries and the Americas. Then now from the US, some of these have gone out, gone into the Eastern countries where we're talking about China and India being the hubs actually that is where we get the raw pharmaceutical products, raw medicines, even the final products that are being generated, especially the generics coming now from India. So in the past, the key bit for us was to get the medicines to get to people where they need them. We needed medicines, diseases, diseases were already diagnosed, we knew what was affecting them. So we need to make medicines available. And therefore, anybody who was able to manage that kind of a supply chain that is ensuring medicines are made available was able to do the job and we are good with that. But now in this current moment, when we're looking about the current space, there are new advances that are happening beyond just ensuring medicines are available, which was still facing challenges. There's now other concerns that are coming in. At the initial moment, we didn't have challenges of falsified and fake medicines. Whether they were there, there was little concern on them because Actually, there was a gap in terms of need and somebody was taking advantage of that. This gap still exists, but now we are cognizant that there are more players who are actually very shrewd and they're coming into the space to supply substandard falsified and counterfeit medicines, which are affecting the healthcare delivery. And therefore we need to curb the market and ensure we secure the supply chain network to limit this kind of people off. That is on one end. Two, there's a growing focus on the patient safety. And when you're talking about patient safety, then you need to begin to understand that the medicines that are getting to people have to be of the right quality. They have to be effective and they have to be safe for them. And that is another critical piece that is now in the current domain. And beyond that, we're now looking at some of the advances that, for example, in the current, in the current space, we had COVID-19 disrupting supply chains. And therefore, with that, the key bit was 
how do we ensure such kind of unforeseen circumstances do not disrupt our distribution network, do not impede healthcare service delivery? And now you see their conversations coming around, well, can we do pool procurement? Can we have national agencies that are kind of coordinating this kind of pool procurement? And how do we take advantage of such dynamics? Local manufacturing, can we strengthen our local production capacities? At the end of the day, whether we have local or international production levels, at the end of the day, we still need pharmaceutical supply chain professionals who are going to manage these dynamics. And before even we get about talking about pool procurement, we need to understand what are the need levels, what are the market dynamics, what are the priorities that we need to focus on, who is financing these, and that means we need the data that is going to shape this future. And therefore, when we look at the past where the, access, the focus was on having medicines available, now we are getting to a space where beyond getting medicines available, we need to ensure they are the right medicine, the quality of the medicine. We need to ensure they are safe and we need to ensure they are effective. For some of the times you'd be expecting somebody taking medicines, which are not acting on them because they are not effective, the ineffective products. So we need to ensure those are being met. But now in the future practice, there are some emerging trends. And these emerging trends are around patient safety, as I've mentioned, which is a current and an ongoing conversation. We are looking at the actually the entire pharmaceutical value chain, supply chain specialists who can see we are already releasing products into the market. Can we understand the dynamics of that product to be able to report them in case of patient safety? They now collaborate pharmacovigilance specialists because if I'm managing movement of products, I cannot leave the safety of that medicine to the person. The person who is dealing with pharmacovigilance should be able to guide me and give me the insights that product X that came from you, David, is not working on our patients or probably they're having side effects that are affecting the patients. And therefore, maybe there's a challenge in the pharmaceutical distribution network and you need to look into that. That can be a, maybe a change in the temperature that is being used from the recommended, which is affecting the quality. That is making it ineffective or even for the biologicals, making them to be contaminated. When they're contaminated, they're affecting patients. So as a pharmaceutical supply chain specialist, I need to understand that dynamic and be able to respond to them. Those are key things. We're now having a conversation around self-care and self-medication and related condoms. We know this is happening. And patients want more autonomy and control over their care and their healthcare lifestyles. So health and wellness of the patients is being taken care of by themselves. And our role as healthcare professionals is to support them on that journey. So as pharmaceutical supply chain professional, one of the key things you need to be asking yourself, how do I make my products when you talk about them as self-care products? Accessible to the patients, yes, which is key for them because of their self-care. But if they are accessible, are they of the right quality? Are they safe? Is it convenient in terms of access? Is it affordability? So what are the key parameters that we need to look into in this dynamic? We now see most people coming into the online space, digital pharmacies, online pharmacies, e-pharmacy, the landscape, to ensure patients are getting the medicines. But as much as we're talking about that, somebody might manage an online store, but you have an online store where the supply is a problem. I can buy it online, but it never gets delivered to me. How do you ensure that? When I buy it online on your platform, it will get delivered within the stipulated timelines that I need, that it's going to affect my quality, it will not be affected in terms of the handling. And the follow-up care in terms of what information do I need to be able to use it better is available to me as a patient with using that product. So these are the new dynamics that we need to look into. Ultimately, when we now know most of the focus has been on climate change and we acknowledge this climate change that's happening, and we need to be able to be environmentally conscious and to be able to design interventions that are going to curb this. And one of the key things that we look about in terms of environmental pollution has been pharmaceuticals and pharmaceutical wastes. And this is because we don't have metrics that are coming in to ensure fake medicines are being taken out of the market. Any expired medicines are being taken out of the market. The recall processes when a medicine has been found to have adverse events, how are we taking it back from the market? That is what we talk about, our reverse logistics. And pharmaceutical supply chain management will not only focus on getting products from the manufacturing site to the patient, but also taking up any unused products which have expired, which are not going to be used anymore, back to the distribution chain, to the distraction point, because these are the things that are going to affect our environment. And if you're not able to take responsibility for that, that's now going to be an issue of concern that needs to be addressed. And when you look at it in the current domain, we have National Environmental Management Authority, NEMA in Kenya, that is working with the Kenya Private Sector Alliance to design the extended producer responsibility bill. This is to give the pharmaceutical companies and the manufacturers or even distributors responsibility over managing the pharmaceutical waste and product, expired products that are going into the market. So can we have that for reverse logistics in place? And as pharmacy professionals, we need to be asking ourselves, 
where do our skills and competencies come into this? Are we going to be able to manage the, let's say, for example, distraction mechanism for such kind of products, pharmaceutical products? If not, then what would be required of us? How do we make it successful? We were really causing contamination. For example, I would say pharmaceutical supply chain professional at a pharmacy level, at the lowest level. Can you engage your patients to be able to bring back unused medicines, to bring back expired medicines, to bring back the pack for those products that are now or high risk, for example, anti-cancer products, the packages that are being used to reduce the cytotoxicity, the toxic effects to the other people in the community. So that is reverse logistics. So it's coming up and now people are giving it attention because we know as much as we are saying we are saving patients, we are providing the medicines, the medicines, if not used right, are causing more harms, including antibiotics when we talk about antimicrobial resistance. So reverse logistics is becoming a critical bit in terms of healthcare service delivery. The other bit we're looking at reliable access to safe, effective, quality, and affordable medicines, which has been the case all along. Nobody wants expensive medicine, that is affordability. Nobody wants unsafe medicines. Everybody needs them to be safe. They have to be effective because I'm having next, for example, headache, and I need something that could can lessen my pain in terms of the headache. It has to be effective. The quality of the medicine, is it of the right quality? That is a critical parameter. And that has been the space. And there's more focus on this to ensure we have all the fake medicines coming out of the market so that we have a streamlined pharmaceutical supply chain. And other, these are some of the things that are being driven by stringent regulations that are coming into place, policy frameworks, stakeholder engagements that are ensuring that at the end of the day, we are serving the communities the best way we can and delivering on that. And as I mentioned, in some of these things, we're talking about data. And when we talk about data, then we know digital technologies, I mentioned online platforms that are coming up, data tools that are being used. Do we know the product flow from the manufacturer? Where is it going through up to the patient? Do we know where the product was last sold? Let's say, for example, one of the supply chain stakeholders, if it was a pharmacy, which pharmacy, which location? Can we track it back if we want to have a recall mechanism, reverse logistics? So that is where we now follow the product flow. But as much as we're in that space, we have to acknowledge that for any pharmaceutical product in the pharmaceutical supply chain network, there is finance flow. There's somebody who has to pay for it. Where is the, can we follow the trail of the money? When you talk about anti counterfeit products, when you see what Interpol does, they're tracking who is financing this product, where is the money coming from? Even in the legitimate pharmaceutical supply chain network, we need to follow the money trail because that money is critical to ensure that manufacturers are able to sustain their production line, the producers are able to, the distributors are able to, to sustain their distribution, and the ultimate patient is able to pay for that medicine so that we see where is the money coming from. So the product flow and the finance flow are moving parallel, but in the opposite direction to ensure that visibility is available. And when you talk about the product flow, there are movements toward having a track and trace system. And that is going to ensure we have a product that is coded, getting into the country. Everybody can see which trail did that product follow to the ultimate consumer so that we have clear visibility. And pharmaceutical supply chain and logistics management specialists are going to be needed to have these kind of skills and overview in terms of what needs to happen. And therefore, those are new openings. Ultimately, with the pandemic, as I mentioned, in the current space, there's been more focus on how do we ensure this pandemic preparedness and supply chain planning for outbreaks. And this is to ensure we have a robust safety net. We have a cushion that is going to ensure that if at all we have a pandemic, the need for other medicines, for example, when you talk about anti-malarials in Kenyan context, Africa, we talk about sickle cell disease management, then hydroxy ureas and related products. Who is going to ensure they are available? When you're talking about HIV AIDS, if at all a pandemic is going to disrupt care for HIV AIDS patients, that's going to be a problem. When you talk about menstrual hygiene, your menses will not rest because there's a pandemic. The menses will still be coming. So how do we ensure we have a robust supply chain management that is going to ensure that these patients, these people that we're serving in our respective community through the pharmaceutical value chain are able to access the services that they still need? So these are some of the conversations that are going. And there is need for people who are in the pandemic preparedness with mechanical teams that are going to have understanding on how to manage supply chain in such kind of situation, what are the risk mitigation measures, what measures do we need to put in place to ensure we meet the immediate needs, we cushion ourselves from future prospective needs, and actually ensure we have a secure pharmaceutical value chain. Then the key bit for us now is to look at how as pharmacists can we leverage these trends to harness the opportunities that lie in the pharmaceutical value chain. And from a perspective, I believe the first point for us is to understand these are the dynamics. 
once you know the dynamics, you'll know what kind of skills are needed. We need you to be able to interface with regulatory affairs professional, pharmaceutical, pharmacovigilance specialist. Do we need the capacity building? You need the skills, the competency that are essential for you to be able to serve this particular purpose. So that is the capacity building. And one of the key things that I just wanted to mention at this point is, we have some engagement that we're having as from Africa Pharmaceutical Network on the other end, where we have supply chain management trainings, other courses that are coming up in terms of building capability of the pharmaceutical workforce to be able to deliver on their mandate. And I'm hoping we can take advantage of such opportunities to be able to grow as professionals. So that is the capacity building, that is the first phase. Be aware, once you're aware, you can build the skills that you need to deliver on that. Once you're aware, then the key bit for us is with project management with orientation on global health priorities. When we talk about orientation to global health priorities, we know there's an interest to focus, increased focus on patient safety. What key skills, what key capabilities can you deliver in that space to ensure we have more value that is being delivered on that space as a professional? That is, the patient safety, are you able to inform patients where they need to report, for example, in pharmacovigilance? Do you know how to report the mechanisms to the producer to ensure the products are not getting into the market? How do you ascertain that the products that you're buying as a pharmaceutical distributor, wholesaler, or even retailer are of the right quality? the track and trace mechanisms. So do you know how the project management skill to be able to encompass these and even apply the digital technologies and data? So that is where we're talking about the project management, the initiation, imp planning, implementation, monitoring and evaluation, control measures to ensure that ultimately we are delivering reliable, uh, ensuring there's reliable access to safe, effective quality and affordable medicines. And when we talk about the project management as well, we can see in the supply chain component, we have the patient access programs. And these patient access programs, I remember there's a video that I did on this as well. You can have a look at it after this, where we'll see there is a need for medicines. As a professional, you can know who can distribute these medicines to the patient. How do we design that project to be able to be financed by the patients or every other stakeholders to ensure the value chain is interconnected and is functioning efficiently that the patients who need medicines are able to buy them. The producers who are producing the medicines are actually able to supply them to the market and you'll be the intermediary facilitating that kind of trade and synchrony in management and movement of products. If you're able to do that, that is a win for all of us. And ultimately, the last bit of this is collaborations and partnerships. We're not going to be able to do this alone. Pharmaceutical management professionals and experts can only exist within an ecosystem and that ecosystem will encompass the pharmaceutical producers, the manufacturers that we're talking about. We can have the patients who are consuming them we have governments who are financing some of these healthcare products. Development partners, the likes of Gavi, Global Fund, WHO, USAID and related organizations. How do we collaborate with them to ensure that we are managing the supply domain and the dynamics? We have health logistics partnering with us to offer some of the courses on pharmaceutical supply chain management. Can we collaborate with them to deliver interventions? Can we collaborate with them to learn more and support such kind of pharmaceutical supply chain management trends? and position ourselves as reliable players in the pharmaceutical value chain. I believe as pharmacists, as pharmaceutical professionals, we are equipped and able to address this. For example, when you talk about patient safety, you have the understanding of the impact of medicines. You are the medicines expert. Leverage that technical capability and apply with the operational skills and techniques, the competency that you have as a supply chain professional. Then once you blend these two, you are now able to deliver an intervention by understanding what are the trends, what are the skills you have, then applying them strategically and effectively and efficiently to ensure at the end of the day, patients have the medicines they need in a reliable manner, and then it's affordable to them, and we can see how we can make those better. And just another thing that I just wanted to mention at this particular point in time, we know we have some other people, players that are coming into the industry, meaning the pharmaceutical supply chain and logistic management space is a lucrative area. We have Mark Cuban in the US venturing into the space with a focus on lowering the cost and promoting efficiency then why is it they're carrying into the space? What are the new ideas they're bringing from other industries that they've been working in? Can we adopt these skills and these insights in our own cooperation because this is our stronghold, this is our space. We've been there for a long period of time. We've mastered the skills, we've learned the dynamics of the industry and we are able to serve the patient the best way we can. We're able to manage the systems and serve the communities. So when you talk about supply chain management, Detach your mind from thinking of it as moving product from point A to point B. It's more of the technicality, the operational skills, and looking at what need are we serving at the local level. 
when we address that need, be able to serve our communities and be able to be better professionals. And ultimately, as a professional looking at where to pursue, what to pursue, and how to grow in the profession, these are some of the emerging trends that are coming up and you need to take advantage of them as early as now so that when the future comes, you'll be the person shaping that future. And the future will already be ready and primed for your success. Thank you so much. Let's engage in the next one. If you enjoyed these conversations, subscribe to the channel. Let's keep the conversation going. Let's drive the growth of the pharmaceutical industry together, me and you, so that in the future, it won't be a pharmaceutical industry that is not robust as we wish it for. We won't be complaining, but rather shaping that future that we'll be able to be proud of and say the pharma industry is where it needs to be because we've done what needs to be done and we are continuing to do it better. Thank you. Subscribe and let's engage moving forward. Thank you.